Hello, everyone. This is the talk on federation in Kubernetes. I'm Dmitry Mish, and I work for University of California, San Diego. This talk will have two parts. In part one, I will describe our cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster, how we use Admiralty, how our project came to the current state it's in. And in the second part, uh, Adrian, the creator of Admiralty, will describe how Admiralty is working. Also, we will have the demo on how Admiralty works. So our project is called PRP, Pacific Research Platform, and it grew from a project uh, measuring network performance. So the initial problem was that uh, University of California, San Diego had multiple campuses connected with what's called Science DMZ, a scientific network, uh, 10 to 100 gigabits per second, so pretty fast. And sometimes this, uh, some segments of the network doesn't perform the way they're supposed to. And PRP was measuring uh, network performance by sending test data between those locations. Uh, that was done manually, and at some point uh, there were just more nodes that PRP uh, could handle manually. And there was an idea to deploy Kubernetes on top so that Kubernetes would orchestrate those measurement um, software. Uh, once we deployed Kubernetes, we realized that now we have a cluster of nodes. Uh, we just occasionally send data, but mostly sitting idle. And we started providing uh, those hardware resources to scientists uh, to just do their computations. And we saw exponential growth of our cluster because it was really easy to onboard our, our system, uh, bring in the container, run it, and get free access to the resources for scientific use. We call this cluster Nautilus. Uh, at some point, more projects started donating hardware to us. Uh, we partnered with Internet2, Open Science Grid donated some nodes, uh, more uh, networks were coming to us. And this is how now it looks in US. Uh, so we have a scenic network in California providing us the uh, internet access. And there is a bunch of uh, regional networks that also donate hardware to our cluster. So basically we have national Kubernetes cluster aggregating a bunch of uh, computing resources. Uh, at some point we started bringing in uh, GPU nodes, uh, storage nodes, and so on. So now our cluster is pretty big. And at some point, it started growing internationally. So on international scale, uh, we have nodes in Europe, in Asian Pacific re uh, region. We have nodes in Singapore, uh, Korea, Guam, Australia. And uh, if we're talking about nodes themselves, those are co called Fiona nodes. Uh, flash IO network appliances. So those nodes are optimized for uh, fast networks, so they can actually uh, leverage those uh, speeds. And some nodes can fit up to eight uh, gaming GPUs, and some nodes have a bunch of uh, hard disks which we use for storage for our Ceph cluster. So when we talk about federation, our current state is that we have our uh, PRP Nautilus cluster, uh, national for US and some international nodes. Um, now it has 7,000 uh, CPU cores, more than 500 GPUs, 2.5 petabytes of, uh, of self storage. Additional to that, we deployed a couple of smaller clusters. We have a development K3S ARM cluster. We have development Windows uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Agonis GPU cluster that's for gaming and 3D visualization. 
and uh, we spawn to AWS cloud. So all those clusters are separate. It's really hard to integrate all that hardware in one. And we need a federation to work with them. Also, we partnered with several other smaller clusters, and there is a federation already established between those locations. So basically, all clusters can finally talk to each other, but are controlled by different organizations and different people. Uh, that's the huge benefit of Admiralty, because all our other projects are seeing federation as one cluster controlling others. It's not one level federation between them. And uh, what we are looking forward to is when Expanse uh, supercomputer is deployed, it's also going to have the Kubernetes cluster as a part of it, and Admiralty will be used to federate Expanse with Notos and other clusters. And that will bring a theoretical uh, expansion to 100,000 uh, cores. Of course, we will not get all of them, but we, uh, that's a pretty big increase in uh, what we federate with. So how can we use resources between those clusters? Uh, as I said, uh, most of these clusters belong to different organizations who want to set their own rules. So we cannot, federation cannot dictate uh policies for running stuff in different clusters and scientists who use those clusters usually have access to only one or several namespaces they again don't control the whole cluster and so federation should uh, allow working on namespaces level when people don't have to bug the admin to federate but they can establish federations between the piece of the cluster that they control. Uh, additional to those uh, small clusters, uh, which are on-prem, as I said, we federate with clouds, uh, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud. If we need uh, some resources from those clusters, if we have some big workloads or we want specialized hardware, uh, we can always federate with those by simply running uh, some temporary cluster in those and then establishing the federation. So how do we use federation now? Uh, GitLab CI is what we started with. It's super convenient to, like when we need to build a container on some uh, specialized hardware like ARM or Windows, uh, instead of manually creating a GitLab runner somewhere else or trying to join this node in our big cluster, we just federate. And that will be in the demo. Uh, so now we federate with Windows and ARM and our GitLab, by just tagging the job, can build the container in some other cluster. And this container will be stored in GitLab registry. Uh, network monitoring, right now we have a bunch of monitoring pods in our uh, large cluster, but the goal is that any other cluster that wants to have automated monitoring can just join our federation and get all the monitoring pods. Uh, jobs bursting, if some cluster has some unused resources and another one is overloaded, it's always useful to just burst to another cluster. And clusters can share their computing resources without actually uh, reattaching nodes, so that's super convenient. Uh, medical data use is a big one. Uh, some data can, is highly protected. It cannot leave some cluster but this data can be used for uh, some computation and then results of this computation can be shared uh, when it's anonymized. So federation again can let you spawn your uh, computing job in another cluster, uh, get some product, anonymize it, get it back. So this is super convenient. Uh, special devices, Internet of Things, some devices are really small and tiny 
and they can just join a big cluster and just monitoring pods will kill it. So again, this is super useful to federate and uh, some IoT devices are again controlled by some other people and federation helps establish those connections without getting or requiring access to the specialized hardware. Uh, future of federation, we are now working on the project that will allow us to uh, create on-demand layer to a fast pass around the world. So there is a that's a project with Surfnet. Uh, it's called NSA AutoGoal, and uh, this project already can create a layer two connections and uh, tear them down on request. And what we are writing now is a special CRD and operator, which will allow pods that spawn in some remote location to create a path, for example, to storage in some other location. And this path will exist while the pod is running, and then this uh, path will, will disappear. And Federation will help us to run this across several Kubernetes clusters. So if some cluster wants to talk to another cluster, it just creates a layer two connection, and that will be controlled by a standard Kubernetes API. So this is a really great project that we're working on. This is a demo on Federation. In this demo, I will show how Federation works in our production cluster. I will not go through details of establishing the connection. It's all covered in documentation, and this is supposed to be the short demo. So now we're looking at the nodes in our production cluster, and we see that the first node has the role of cluster and master. This is virtual node created by Admiralty. So basically, this represents the whole remote cluster and federated pods will run in this node while the actual node is below it. In this demo, I will show how our GitLab can spawn pods in other clusters and get results from them. So here is the jobs. Um, table of our GitLab. The, these jobs are building container and uh, putting it in GitLab registry. But while uh, most projects are just building uh, containers in our regular cluster, this uh, project is setting up this architecture ARM64 uh, tag on the jobs which make them go to special runner in GitLab. Let's look at our GitLab namespace. So in this namespace, we will see that it's labeled with multi-cluster scheduler enabled. This will tell Admiralty to look at this namespace and wait for pods that we mark as federated. If we go in this namespace, we will see several runners uh, running already on regular uh, nodes. If you look at deployments, there is already deployment that I created called GitLab Runner Federated. We can look at it. We will see that in template for pods, it has the multi-cluster Admiralty IO slash elect annotation. So this again will tell Admiralty that pods from this deployment should be federated. So Admiralty will decide where to send them to. Let's scale this deployment to one. And we will see that this new pod is scheduled to run on this virtual node. So if you look at all uh, pods, all of them are in our cluster, but this one pod is running somewhere else. Uh, we can look at our ARM cluster. Uh, again, this is GitLab namespace, but this is now remote cluster federated with our large one. And this is the node 
this pod is running on. So we see that GitLab runner actually started on remote node and in our uh, large cluster, we only have the proxy for this pod. Let's switch back to our main cluster. So this runner already registered automatically in GitLab. And if we rerun one of the jobs, the runner will run it remotely. So if we get, go again to remote cluster, we'll see that new uh, job started. And it just finished. This is pretty quick. And the result of this job went into the local container registry in our GitLab. So this completed successfully. Uh, this allows GitLab to run runners in federated clusters without manually setting them up and control them from one single location. Hi, my name is Adrian. I'm the CEO of Admiralty. Admiralty is the company behind the open source project of the same name. Admiralty is what makes the decentralized federation presented by Dimitri possible. It's a multi-cluster control plane that uses common Kubernetes extension patterns. This talk will focus on virtual kubelet and the scheduler framework. What is virtual kubelet? This is a screenshot from the virtual kubelet website. So like the Kubernetes kubelet that runs on each node, a virtual kubelet instance presents itself as a virtual node, but instead of running containers on a local VM, it runs them on a remote system. And there are 11 known providers to this state, including Admiralty. In the case of Admiralty, virtual kubelets represent remote clusters. To help us understand the concepts that I'll explain later, let's consider this example use case where a user submits jobs in their own cluster, cluster A, but containers run in other clusters, B and C. And so in cluster A, there are virtual nodes that represent the other clusters. The pods created by the Kubernetes job controller are mutated by Admiralty's admission controller into what we call proxy pods. We call them that like that because they represent other pods, not because they are proxy in the networking sense. Admiralty's proxy pod scheduler schedules those pods to the virtual nodes and creates candidate pods in the other clusters. Some of those candidates become delegate pods that are bound to real nodes. Those real nodes could actually be other virtual nodes. You can imagine several levels of inception. Admiralty also includes a bunch of controllers to update pod statuses, make config maps, secrets, and other dependencies follow pods. Notice that cluster A needs to talk to clusters B and C, and we'll see different ways to do that uh, in a minute. Let's go back to Virtual Kubelet and how Admiralty implements it. Virtual Kubelet has four main responsibilities. The first responsibility is to register a node object. Admiralty creates virtual nodes based on user-created targets and cluster targets. Those are custom resource definitions that basically uh, give a name to a virtual node and refer to a secret that will be used to talk to the corresponding target cluster. The second responsibility is heartbeat. Uh, Kubernetes needs to know that a node is healthy at regular intervals. Uh, otherwise, it'll evict the pods uh, if the node is not responding. So the virtual kubelet in Admiralty um, checks the health of the target clusters and updates the condition of the node. The third and maybe the most important responsibility is to handle uh, pods. So to run the actual containers somewhere um, and in Admiralty, this is most of the logic with multi-cluster scheduling, uh, but status feedback, cross-cluster garbage collection, and so on. And of course, there are some uh, uh, other features like uh, 
um, handling logs requests and exec requests. And in Admiralty's case, it's very simple. We just forward those requests to the target cluster's Kubernetes API. The three last rows um, require kubeconfigs to uh, call the target clusters. So let's talk about that. In Admiralty, clusters are connected in the control plane uh, in one-to-one -one relationships. And we say that a source and a target cluster are connected when controllers in the source cluster can call the Kubernetes API server of the target cluster. For that, we need three ingredients, routing, authentication, and authorization. Uh, routing may require uh, a VPN or a tunnel uh, if the clusters uh, on public or if they're in different VPCs. Uh, authorization, the last one, uh, is, uh, is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, it uses uh, outback resources in the target cluster. And that's very important to Dimitri and uh, his colleagues and partners. Uh, they want cluster admins to be in control of who can do what in their clusters. And authentication can be done uh, using uh, different methods. The, the nice thing about having one-to-one -one, uh, relationships or connection, cluster connections is that you can uh, build any kind of topology, cluster topology with those. Uh, as long as it's a directed graph, uh, it's valid. And so the first one that comes to mind is probably a management cluster talking to many workload clusters. Or you can do cloud bursting where uh, a cluster is its own uh, target. In the case of the research platform presented by Dimitri, we have a decentralized federation where you know, any, there's no, uh, no leader. I said I would talk about cross-cluster authentication. This could be a, a talk, um, a full talk uh, just by itself. So uh, I'll go very quickly. Uh, the, the, the simplest way to, uh, to achieve it is to uh, take the service account token from target cluster and export it and save it in the source cluster. Uh, and you, could do, you could do the same thing with the certificates API. Uh, instead of a token, you would have a certificate. The problem with those two methods is that you're using the target clusters as an identity provider and not the source cluster. So you need to um, distribute and rotate the secrets yourself. With other methods, you can use an identity provider available in the source cluster to get your tokens or certificates and present those to the target cluster. And that target cluster has to be able to recognize them. And so if you're in the cloud, you can use uh, um, cloud like a Kubernetes service account in, the, in a source cluster can impersonate uh, like an AWS uh, IAM role or Google Cloud service account, Azure service principle, however you name uh, workload identities or um, machine identities. And, and then use that to connect to the uh, target cluster. If you're in control of the master nodes and you can change the API server flags, that's great because then you can use webhook token authentication, authenticating the proxy. If uh, you need a kind of a, a solution that uh, uh, a one size fits all, is uh, you can use an impersonating proxy that uses Kubernetes impersonation uh, to uh, uh, authenticate. And uh, you can check out the Kubo IDC proxy um, project as a prime example. And Admiralty Cloud uses the same print the same concept. Um, Admiralty has two schedulers the proxy scheduler and the candidate scheduler. Proxy scheduler handles proxy pods on the source cluster side, and the candidate scheduler handles the candidate pods created by the proxy scheduler. And they're both built upon the scheduler framework. The scheduler framework is, is great. It's a set of uh, Go language interfaces uh, that allows you to build your own scheduler uh, while retaining all the features of the standard Kubernetes scheduler. 
and adding yours at various uh, extension points in the scheduling cycle and the binding cycle. And so uh, the dots here uh, mark where uh, the, our like IML uh, two schedulers extend the, the, the Kubernetes scheduler. So you can, for example, uh, add some filters, like how to filter nodes, or you can wait before actually binding to a node. And this is useful in Admiralty's multi-cluster scheduling algorithm because the two clusters talk to each other um, using annotations on uh, pod chaperons. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's see uh, how this works. So in this uh, sequence diagram, I have the source cluster on one side and uh, various target clusters on the other side that have the same components with different uh, timelines. When a source spot is created and annotated um, to use Admiralty as a multi-cluster scheduler, it is mutated. Uh, we need to uh, make a few changes to the pod, like a scheduler name, um, change the scheduling constraints so that the pod can tolerate the virtual node. We save the original scheduling constraints for later. Uh, we add a finalizer for cross-cluster garbage collection, different things. Check the documentation for details. While the proxy pod is being uh, scheduled and the virtual nodes that it tolerates are filtered, pod chaperones are created in the target clusters that correspond to those virtual nodes. A pod chaperone has two purposes. Uh, it is the vehicle of annotations. Um, uh, the, the, both schedulers annotate the pod chaperone to communicate. If they annotated one or the other pod, instead, that would invalidate the cache of the scheduler. So it's best to use uh, like another component, another object for that. But also, maybe mostly, and most important uh, from a feature perspective, um, if the source to target cluster connection is interrupted and the a pod has been running for a while, a candidate pod has been, sorry, a delegate pod has been running for a while, but is evicted because a node that it runs on, a real node that it runs on is um, being cordoned, for example, or stop responding. We need a way to recreate the pod. And uh, so, so we need a local controller, and that's the pod chaperone. Pod chaperone is just a pod template that creates the pod. All right, enough about pod chaperone. So, each pod chaperone creates a pod that looks exactly like the pod chaperone. And uh, it includes the, the scheduling constraints that were saved um, in, the, in annotations on the proxy pod so that we can ensure that the intention of the user to schedule on a node that had GPU, for example, is met. At the real node level, in the target clusters. And so, for example here, only two of the target clusters out of three can find a node for the candidates, their respective candidates. So they annotate the, uh, the pod chaperone. The proxy scheduler sees that, selects one of the two uh, using some topology spread constraint or other, um, other proxy pod level scheduling constraints that you can add. And when one is, uh, when the highest scoring node is selected, the pod chaperone in the corresponding target cluster is annotated again, uh, this time to signal the candidate scheduler that it is allowed to bind the candidate pod. That becomes a delegate pod. The proxy scheduler sees that, binds the, finally binds the proxy pod, and the other candidate pods are deleted uh, via the pod chaperones and garbage collection. In summary, it is possible to build a global Kubernetes cluster. You just need super fast networks and some custom built nodes. But even then, Dmitry, colleagues and partners found reasons to use multiple clusters. The Federation around Nautilus has over 10,000 cores currently and will soon be expanded by an order of magnitude with the addition of the Expanse supercomputer. 
Federation uses Admiralty, which itself uses Virtual Kubelet and the scheduler framework. If you're interested, if you're interested in joining the research platform around Nautilus, um, contact them. And if you want to build your own Federation, check out Admiralty. Thank you.